Good morning. Welcome to the weekly news analysis. In this weekly news analysis, we will analyze the news which occurred this week which are very crucial for the India's future. The first one being the troubling courtroom policy making by the Supreme Court. So what is this whole issue about? Over the last three decades, the Supreme Court has gradually designated itself the de facto administrative head of all courts in India. What are the recent developments regarding this issue? A Supreme Court bench approved by the CJI's vision of creating a National Judicial Infrastructure Corporation NGIAC, to administer the judicial infrastructure across the country. A proposal has been sent on these lines to the law ministry. The court is trying to secure through the judicial route what is unlikely to get through administrative negotiation. Now, what is the problem with the decision? There are serious issues of constitutional property with how the Supreme Court gradually takes over the administration of the district judiciary. The Constitution clearly vests that the administration of the district judiciary with the High Court and the state governments. Now, another question arises. What are the some cases where the Supreme Court took over as the administration. Over the last three decades, the Supreme Court has gradually designated itself as the de facto administrative head of all the courts in India. AIJA, which is abbreviated, whose full form is All India Judges Association representing the district judges approached the Supreme Court to secure better service condition for their members. Since then, the Supreme Court has been in a tussle with the union and state governments over the issue of pay for the district judiciary in three major judgments in 1993, 2002 and 202. In Malik, Mahajar Sultan vs. UP Public Service Commission litigation, the Supreme Court prescribed timelines and monitored the recruitment of judges for the district judiciary. In 2006, the Supreme Court decided on a legal question regarding the UP Judicial Service Rules 2001. The Supreme Court took control the way appointments are made to the district judiciary. Allahabad High Court granted a prolonged stay of criminal proceeding. It was transformed by the Supreme Court into a vehicle for an assortment of judicial reform. These were the cases where the Supreme Court took over the administration. Now, in what ways Supreme Court observed the administration of the district courts? The multiple, uh, multiple ways were the SC gave direction to the law commission to study specific issues. Second being the Supreme Court gave a specific formula to calculate the required number of judges for the district judiciary to all high courts. This new method of calculation contradicted a formula proposed by the Supreme Court in 2002 in one of the AIJA cases. This same case became a launchpad for the Supreme Court's demand for the creation of a national umbrella organization to look after the judiciary needs for the infrastructure. In several other cases, the Supreme Court has also summoned government officials and registrars of the High Court to stand before them and provide explanation. Supreme Court also appointed Amishi Kruye to advise on the nature of the judicial reforms to be implemented. They are generally selected from amongst the senior lawyers of the Supreme Court. Now, what is this criticism behind the Supreme Court's moves? MEC Cruyer. The MEC not only have little experience of practicing before the district judiciary, but they also usually lack the skill and time required for policy research. Most importantly, court-appointed MEC rarely point fingers at the judiciary of their shortcomings. 
This courtroom policy made by the Supreme Court, apart from being fragmented across various benches and MEC, there is a little hope for the constituency. This is also undemocratic since it lacks avenues for public participation. In the same way, it treats principles like federalism very casually, often proposing one-size-fits-all solution for the entire district judiciary across India. In certain cases, judicial reforms could be better served by the Supreme Court's withdrawal. It may begin by creating a culture of transparency within the judiciary. Our second analysis being the sustained attack on federalism. Steps by union government have undermined the principles of federalism, especially fiscal federalism. Now, we'll deeply analyze this issue. Amid the pandemic, some of statements by the state resonate strongly with the raising complaint about the union government's anti-federal moves. Now, we'll discuss what is federalism and what do we mean by it. Federalism is basically the division of power between the government at the center and the state. Their powers are divided equally in the constitution of India as centerless, stateless and concurrentless. But in the concurrentless, both have equal power and the power struggle occurs from here. In India, the powers are shared between the union and the state while inclining towards the strong center by both. Now, what are the steps by the union government which undermine the principles of federalism? The answer is divided in two subcategories. The first one the being the fiscal federalism and second category being the weakening of the state's autonomy. Under fiscal federalism, there were many moves by the un union government which undermined the principles of federalism, such as increasing the monetary shares of the state in centrally sponsored schemes, the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission, imposition of demonetization without adequate consultation with the states, institutionalization of the goods and services tax, outsourcing the statutory functions under the Smart Cities Mission, delay in transfer of the GST compensation, enlarging the non-divisible pool of taxes in the form of cess and petrol tax, instituting the agricultural infrastructure and development cess, and many others such as One Nation, One Russian. Under the second category, which is uh, weakening of the state autonomy, there were many laws and acts which were introduced, such as first one being the farm laws, second one being the Banking Regulation Amendment Act of 2020, third one being the Government of National Capital Territory Amendment Act 2021, fourth one, the Indian Marine Fisheries Bill 2021, fifth one, the Draft Electricity Amendment Bill 2020, sixth one, the Dam Safety Bill 2019, Next one being the National Education Policy of 2020, the Draft Blue Economy Policy and the creation of the Ministry of Cooperation and Reserve Bank of India Directive as on cooperatives. These were the moves which resulted in weakening of state's autonomy. Another major factor which played or complicated this issue was the pandemic. The factors which resulted or which were created by the pandemic were curtailing the powers, cess and surcharge, GST, reduction of state's share of union tax, non-tax avenues and the last one being FRBM borrowing limit. Now we will deeply analyze each issues starting with curtailing the powers. States were curtailed in aspects relating to COVID-19 management such as procurement of testing kits, vaccination, use of disaster management act, unplanned national lockdown. When the second wave caught the government unprepared, union ministers 
use the health as a state subject argument to counter criticism. The second point being cess and surcharge. The share of non-divisible pool cess and surcharge in total taxes collected by the union government jumped from 12.67% in 2019 and 20 to 23.46% for in 2020 to 21. The third point being the GST. During the pandemic, the union government repeatedly violated the compensation guarantee to the state under the GST regimen. The crisis was aggravated in 2020 when the union government proposed borrowing as an option to address the shortfall in GST compensation. This meant that they were not only getting the share of GST collection due to them, but were also forced into debt which they would have to service. The CAG found that the union government in 2018 and 19 wrongly retained Rs. 47,272 crores of GST compensation says in Consolidated Fund of India that was supposed to be transferred to the states. Fourth one being the reduction of tax states share of union tax. The 2021 and 22 budget estimates indicate that the state share of the union tax has reduced to 30% against the mandated 41% devaluation prescribed by the 15th Finance Commission. Non-tax revenue is the fifth reason which was created by the pandemic. The union government issued a clarification that the funding to the Chief Minister Disaster Relief Fund will not be considered as CSR expenditure unlike the case with PM Cares Fund. And it also suspended the transfer a member of the Parliament Local Area Development Funds to the Consolidated Fund of India. FRBM Borrowing List Borrowing Limit Most state demanded for increasing the borrowing limits under the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act FRBM from 3% to the 5%. The union government also decided to increase the FRBM borrowing limit, linking it to the performance of state in fulfilling certain conditions, which were implementation of one nation, one ration policy, ease of doing business reforms, urban local body, and fourth last one being the power sector reform, making it difficult for the states. Now, what are the solutions which are suggested by the experts the first one being as uh, the first one being as recommended by the national commission to review the working of the constitution a formal institutional framework has to be created to facilitate consultation between the union and the states in the area of legislation under the concurrent list second one being instead of reaching out to each other during only in the crisis situation, Chief Minister should try to create forums for regular engagement on this issue. Third one being, since federal flexibility is a crucial factor in shaping the future of our government, our democracy, the union government needs to invest resources toward effective consultation with the state as a part of lawmaking process. And the last one being, the union needs to establish a system where the citizens and the states are treated as partners and not subjects. Now, for the last news analysis, that is, can India become a technology leader? A strengthened public sector will create more opportunities for the private business. So, Every time a technology giant chooses an India born techie as its leader, there is justifiable swelling of pride in the country, but also some disappointment. Whenever we think of any big tech like Google, uh, Twitter, or Microsoft, there is uh, two things in common. The first one being they are multinational companies, and second one being all of them as an Indian 
CEO heading the company. So now, why is India still not a major player in technology? This question may arrive to many people when they saw this news. There are two reasons for this. The first one being the inability to use, inability to use opportunity and second one being the brain drain. Inability to use the opportunity. There is a popular narrative in the India failures are linked to its inability to make use of market driven growth opportunities. Second one being brain dead. Brain drain. In the brain drain, uh, as of the in the brain drain, there are among um, the educated and professionally accomplished communities in that country, which after studying from this country migrate to another country. Instead of working here, they work in another country. As of report in 2019 showed 2.7 million Indian immigrants in the US. So they mostly work there. So now what are the roles of state which we can learn from other countries which are major source of uh, being the technological power hub. We can take the example of two countries. The first one being the US and second one being the China. I know China has been our enemy for many years but it's also important that we learn from our enemy. We can use the example of US. In US an invisible hand of the US government has been there to prop up each of the so-called triumphs of the enterprise and free market in the US. Research by Mariana Mazakoto shows that the state has been crucial to the introduction of new generation of technologies including the computer, the internet and the nanotech industry. Public sector funding has also been a crucial factor. Recently, public sector funding developed the algorithm that eventually led to Google's success and helped discover the molecular antibody, antibodies that provided the foundation of biotechnology. The role of government has been even more prominent in shaping the economic growth of China which is racing with US for supremacy in technology. Even by even while being hailed as a factory of the world, China had been stuck at the low value adding segment of the global production network, earning only a fraction of the price of the goods it manufactured. However, as a part of 2011 government plan, it made a successful foray into new strategic industry such as alternative fuel cars and renewable energy. China's achievement came not because it turned capitalist but instead by combining the strength of the public sector, market and globalization. China's state-owned enterprises SOEs, were seen as inefficient and bureaucratic. China, however, rather than privatizing them or letting them weaken with neglect, the China state restructured, restructured the SOEs. On the other hand, SOEs strengthened their presence in strategically important sectors such as petrochemicals and telecommunication as well as in technologically dynamic industry such as electronics and machineries. So now, what went wrong in India's case? This is a question and the answer to it, when India inaugurated planning and industrialization in the early 1950s, Public sector funding of the latest technology of that time included space and atomic research and establishment of institutions such as Indian institutions of technology were, were among the hallmarks of the effort. Many of these institutions have over the years attained world class standards. The growth of the information technology and pharmaceutical industries have been fastest in Bangalore and Hyderabad. However, the roadblocks to the progress have been many, including India's poor achievement in school education. 
In 1991, when India embraced markets and globalization, it should have redoubled the efforts to re-strengthen its technological capabilities. And one of the most crucial steps where India failed was instead of spending on research and development uh, in the, uh, as a proportion of GDPs declined in India from 0.85% in 19, from 1990 to 1991 to 0.65% in 2018. And in contrast, the proportion increased over the years in China and South Korea to reach from 2.1% and 4.5 per, to 4.5% respectively by 2018. As you see, in the R&D, the, the amount allotted from the GDP has declined, which is stated as one of the most crucial factors for where India failed. But there are some positive aspects for India as well, such as higher enrollment of ter territory education. The number of persons enrolled for territory education in India is a way ahead of corresponding numbers in all other countries except China. Further, graduates from STEM, which, uh, whose full form is Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics, programs as a proportion of all graduate was 32.2% of India for India in 2019. One of the highest among all countries according to the UNESCO data. So what are the our ways forward in this situation? There are many ways such as India needs to sharply increase its public spending to improve the quality and access to the higher education. An overwhelming proportion of the tertiary education students in India are enrolled in private institutions. It was 60% for those enrolled for bachelor degrees in 2017, while average for G20 countries was 33% only, according to OECD. The Making in India initiative will have to go beyond increasing the ease of business for private industry. Indian industry needs to deepen the broaden, deepen and broaden its technological capabilities. India, which will soon have the twice number of internet users as in the US, is a larger market for all kinds of new technologies. While this presents a huge opportunity, the domestic industry has not yet managed to derive the benefits. This can only happen if universities and public institutions in the countries are strengthened and emboldened to enter areas of technology development for which the private sector may have neither the resources nor the patience. Another step which can the government can take is the PSUs which are public sector undertaking should be valued for their potential long term contribution to economic growth the technologies they can create and the strategic and knowledge assets they can build. The strengthened public sector will create more opportunities for private businesses and widen the entrepreneurial base. Small and medium entrepreneurs will flourish when there are mechanisms for diffusion of publicly created technologies along with greater availability of bank credit and other forms of assistance. I would conclude by saying, the next big story about India's prowess does not have to be from the US, but could come from thousands of such entrepreneurs in far-flung corners of our own country. Thank you. That's all for today's weekly news analysis.